Um, From D-Day to Bastogne is the title of this panel. Um, You're in the presence of three uh, amazing individuals and a fourth who could have a seat right now. Sorry, sorry, sorry. You've never been good at following directions. (laughs) We'll start with a gentleman just sitting down right now. Uh, We wanted to seat the World War II veterans first. James Matteo um, was in the television series Band of Brothers. He played Sergeant Frank Perconti and uh, did a wonderful job. Uh, Jimmy has um, also been in a number of movies, including Hook with Robin Williams and Basketball Diaries with uh, Mark Wahlberg and Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, As Sergeant Frank Perconti in Band of Brothers, um, Jimmy did a great job and also became very, very close with Frank Perconti, who just passed away within the last year. Um, So Jimmy has flown in from California to be with us today, so we appreciate Jim coming in. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Sitting next to Jim is another Jim, Pee Wee Martin, and Pee Wee is a veteran of G Company of the 506 Parachute Infantry Regiment, and you may know um, Jim, um, his face, because um, just this year, at the age of, you're 93 now, Jim? Yes. 93. (laughs) Jim jumped into Normandy at the age of 93. He parachuted in for the 70th anniversary of D-Day just a few months ago. And um, he will be the, he's the last World War II veteran who will be allowed to jump into Normandy. And um, it was an amazing, covered by uh, the national news and the world media. And if you know Jim, it's not an amazing feat because Jim, at 93, is one of the most active people you will ever get to meet, chopping wood uh, at his home in Ohio. It's, it's tough to keep up with him, honestly. So we're, we're very uh, fortunate. And Jim is also an original Tacoa man. And that, that is a label that is worn by very few men who are still alive, having trained at Camp Tacoa in Georgia, which is featured in episode one of Band of Brothers. So Jim is one of the last remaining Tacoa men um, out there as well. Sitting next to Jim is Don Burgett. Don is a veteran of A Company, 1st Battalion of the 506th. A um, very, very accomplished author. Um, Don has uh, written four books. He has a fifth coming out. Um, his books um, really started, I guess, the, the real trend of writing about uh, the 506th and, and, and in World War II. And he's written about um, jumping into Normandy and, and being involved in Operation Market Garden and um, all the way through. Uh, uh, Don um, served all the way through with the 506 in World War II. So every major battle the 101st was in, um, Don was in that battle. Next to Don is Ed Shames, Colonel Ed Shames, and he started his service with I Company, 3rd Battalion of the 506. He is the first NCO in the battalion to receive a battlefield commission in Normandy, which came in Carentan, correct, Mr. Shames? And uh, he was transferred to 3rd Platoon of Easy Company and um, was also featured in the Band of Brothers television series. So this will be the same format. I'll ask the first question. I know a lot of you have questions for Jimmy and Jim and Don and Ed, so I'm, I'm not gonna stand in your way with that. My first question is for James Matteo. And, and Jim, I know the actors had to go through a process uh, before you guys started to film. These guys went through training in Tacoa and other places, but the actors also had to go through a boot camp before the series began. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here and, and inviting me. This is a, it's a great company. First off, uh, when I talk about the actors boot camp, it, 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 please, with all due respect, uh, close your ears because it's nothing to what you guys went through. Uh, but as actors, we got these... Uh, these booklets about our individual characters. Uh, mine happened to be this thick, and everything from what toothpaste Frank used to, you know, what his job was now, just everything, all the information. And then we were shipped out to an old British commando base out in Hotfield Studios uh, outside London. And I just remember thinking, all right, this is going to be good. This is going to be cool. And then they told us that when we, we can't call each other by our names. You gotta call them by your character name. I didn't even know half the guy's names until after we wrapped the series. 
I still call people Paul and Garnier and Luz. I, I didn't even know what their real names was until you saw the credits come down. You're like, oh, so your real name is Rick? <laughs> yeah, you, you didn't really know. And uh, and you saluted the rank. You know, whenever you know, Nixon came by or Winters came by, you saluted them. They were allowed to tell you what you needed to do. They just kept it very regimented like that. But I just remember getting on a bus and going to a hangar and they told us we had to get rid of everything and they gave us a green bag filled with just toiletries and just said you're no longer in contact with your family back home and get ready for two, you know, three weeks of hell. And uh, I said, okay. And everybody went, we got our haircuts and then we got back on the bus and we went to another place and this is where we actually were gonna be training in the barracks. And uh, I got off the bus and I just remember a, a drill sergeant just running right up to me, like he picked on me right away for my size. Which, you know, I'm accustomed to, you know, people making fun of my size, but I'm accustomed to be able to fight back, you know, <laughs> say something back, but I didn't, I was so scared. <laughs> and uh, uh, it, it was 5 a.m., you got up, you, you did PT, you did some uh, maneuvers, and then you ate breakfast and you went back out, and, you know, weapons training, just everything. Uh, uh, guard duty, and we did that for two weeks straight and just learned as much as we could about these guys, and it was just, uh, you know, a, a, a history lesson, but it bonded us. I mean, I, I think the producers and, and, and Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks and the other producers were, were real smart about making sure that we bonded and, and knew that the man to the left and, to the, and the man to the right of you were going to help you get through this next 10 months. But uh, it was great. I, I got a lot of fun. It was rough. It rough day sometimes, but it was uh, it was fun. Great. Thank you, Jimmy. Sure. Pee Wee. You jumped into Normandy in 1944, and you jumped into Normandy in 2014. I know no one was shooting at you in 2014 from the ground, but could you explain what was going through your mind when you're jumping? at age 93 into Normandy, and you're looking down, and were you thinking about 1944 at all in, the, in that same jump? No. <laughs> I thought I'd just ask. There's no relationship to it at all. This is a pleasurable thing, and there's two things about it. One is that, yes, there's a little ego to think that I can do that at this age, and the other is I want people to understand that just because you get old, doesn't mean you have to sit around and wait for the Grim Reaper. <laughs> you know, I came into the Army a little differently than most people did. I wasn't psyched up and thought this is wonderful and I'm going to go over there and kill everybody. I grew up listening to stories from veterans of the First World War. You may not know it, but more people of our side died by disease than died in combat. And it was a miserable war for those people. This country became very isolationist. We were not going to go over and pull anybody's chestnuts out of the fire again to hell with them. I was working in the defense industry. I had a deferment. I didn't have to go, and I didn't want to go, and I wasn't going to go. I had no plans to go. It had nothing to do with staying home and making money. It's just the way we felt. In fact, the industrialists didn't want to do war work. They were doing coming out of the Depression, and they felt very comfortable with what they're doing. The government actually had to threaten some of them to make them convert to war work. Henry Ford was absolutely not going to build any airplanes. Now, they had a heck of a time convincing him to build B-24s. B-24s had been built two and three at a time in a big bay. It took several months to get three of them done. By the time Boone Knudsen, who had been head of General Motors, took over the whole operation, they were putting them out 63 minutes every day, all day long, 63 minutes per bomber coming out of that factory because he changed the way they did it. 63 minutes to produce a bomber. What? So you said 63 minutes to produce a bomber? B-24 bombers. Newton told them, Roosevelt had told the people we're going to build 10,000 
airplanes a month, and everybody said he's nuts. Bill Newton said we can do it. And the way he did it, he had dozens of factories making parts. He adopted what, General, what Ford did with Model Ts. He had a production line. They moved along the line, and as the parts came in at the ports where they needed them, and that's how he did it. We did tanks the same way, everything the same way. The industrials got so mad at him, they fired him. And after a year, they took him back. And he's the only civilian that's ever been made a four-star general. And I say he had a great deal to do with winning the war. But anyway, I wasn't going to go. But then I <laughs> was in this factory. We had two sections, one the tool section where I worked, <coughs> the other manufacturing section. The guys in the tool section, most of them were, you know, pretty safe. But in the manufacturing section, they started drafting people up to age 35 with three kids. That's all over the country. Here I am, a young man with no family to worry about, and these are friends of mine with wives and kids are going over to get killed. Also, we were listening to Hitler on the radio every day, and Father Coughlin with his ranting and raving. The military situation was deteriorating, and it was quite obvious that Britain and France alone could not do the job. And I'm not saying we went over to pull their chestnuts out of the fire. That's, that's a myth. That's not true. The Australians, the Canadians, the Polish, and yes, the Russians joined with us and the French and the British to rid the world of a tyrant. Without the cooperation of all those people, this would not have happened. We would have lived in a totally different world. And don't you ever forget it. And when I go back to Europe, each time I go back, I guess I lecture the people and tell them, you lost your freedom once. Don't let it happen again. People who lose their freedom seldom get it back. And it's never gotten back without blood. And I tell them, question your people, your leaders, when they make a law. Make them give you the rationale for it. And I don't just lecture them. I lecture the people in my own home district. And I fight them every day because this country was founded on personal freedom and personal property rights. And I will not tolerate people taking away our rights, period. Thank you, Jim. Now, we went in. General Bradley had watched what was happening in Crete with the Germans. They were the first ones to use parachutists in, in a large operation. It was absolutely a disaster. But uh, General Bradley saw something good in it, and he felt if they changed the curriculum and training, it could be very useful in our army. So he sent a man named Major Lee out to Missoula, Montana, to see how the smoke jumpers did. And Major Lee came back with a good report. Bradley pushed it. The old Army hierarchy didn't want it, but they couldn't overrule Bradley and, and Roosevelt. So they took a man named Colonel Robert Sink. He was a 1927 graduate of the Academy and told him that they wanted him to mold a new regiment such as the Army had never had. They wanted a super outfit of men that could do anything. They said, you can have any personnel that you want. You can have any material that you want, any wish that you want. Nobody can countermand you. They didn't take people from the old army at this time. They took people right out of civilian life who'd never been in the army. They didn't want the class action of the old army to interfere with what they were doing. 
the middle of July of 42, we gathered at a place called Tacoa, way up in the mountains in Georgia. We, he did what was called an airborne basic, several months of intense training and psychological tomfoolery to get people to quit. Previous to this, when people joined the paratroopers, they were sent to Fort Benning, Georgia for four weeks. And in four weeks, they were kicked out and they were supposed to be paratroopers. Typically, they lost 25% going through that operation. Then when they got out, they'd send six or eight guys to this regiment and 10 or 12 to another regiment. Colonel Sink didn't believe in that. He wanted somebody that started together, trained together, did all of their other training together and go to combat together. And his feeling was you had a cohesive unit. You'd already eliminated the misfits and that every man that was there was going to stay. And believe me, to stay in through that training, you had to be fanatically passionate about wanting to be a paratrooper. In that training from July 15th until the 1st of December, we went from 6,500 people to 1,650 people. We were the genesis for all the special units that you have today. They recognized that they needed that, but one unit couldn't do everything. So from that came the Rangers, the Berets, all the special units that they have today. But we were the start of that. Well, anyway, we were really psyched up. We were young and dumb, didn't know very much. We thought we were going to be supermen. We're going to go over and kill all the Germans. We went to the, got on ships and went to England. They put us in little villages. We stayed there a year, trained day and night. Got integrated with the people, even though their culture was different. We had some rough times getting started because the culture was totally different than what we're used to. But we finally became part of the village village of 1,500 people. We had 750 people in our battalion. The Air Force had 2,000 people up on the hill. There were nine pubs, so you can imagine what it was like. But we all made friends. I had four houses in the Parliament of Peace that I could walk into without knocking on a door. It was that familiar. Our parents, all of us, wrote back and forth to these people. We became actually like family. The most pleasant time of my military service was in Ramsbury, England. And I never will forget those people. And I still maintain contacts. A 15-year-old girl working in her father's shop was my barber. We went over. I met her recently when we went over. Uh, we have reestablished contact about 15 years ago. All the girls I know except two are dead. And Rosemary's been fighting cancer for about five years, and Margaret has also had problems. She was a beautiful mulatto. The guys used to follow her around with their tongues hanging out, and she wouldn't look at any of them. And, you know, that's, that's young guys. That's what they go for. We're all the same. Young guys do that? Yeah, imagine that, yes. <laughs> well... Rosemary did make a remark to me, and I remember she was only 15, and she said to me when I was over there, she said, you know, James, she never called me Jim, none of them over did, I was always James, we never did get to cuddle, did we? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, your father kept you on a very short chain. <laughs> well, anyway, we trained, and we had some dry runs, and Patton overran the did our objectives, and finally, we, the big day came. And I don't know how the British knew it, but they must have known because they all lined the roads as we went out the village, some crying because there were some pretty serious relationships. We went to Exeter Airfield. We were in there for about a week under guard, concertina wire around so you couldn't get out or in to tell anybody what was going on. Finally, the big day came. We got on the planes. 
people have asked what it was like. I can tell you this, but I can't relay it the way I did in writings that were published at that time. But we were all psyched up. We were apprehensive. We were uh, arrogant in what we were going to do. We got on the planes at 11 o'clock in the evening on June 5th. We flew across the channel. There was high cirrus clouds, but the moon shone through, and you could see the shadows of the planes on the white caps below. You looked down, you could almost walk across the channel on the ships. The largest armada of ships that had ever been collected together, over 7,000 ships. I wrote at the time that I looked down there and thought very seriously about the responsibility that was on our shoulders. They were all waiting on us and depending on us. But I wondered how great would be the price because I knew we had been told many times even Eisenhower's staff had said there would be 80% 80 per, 80 casualties. It didn't turn out to be that high. But as we approached the coast, fog rolled in. You could hardly see anything. We were flying in serials of nine planes. They almost wingtip to wingtip. And each serial of nine planes had a Rebecca on the ground the pathfinders had jumped before us, and they had what was called a Eureka. It beamed a, a, a signal up to the planes, and each serial of planes had a different frequency, so you didn't land at the wrong place. When the, green, the red light went on, we stood up, and you could hardly stand on your feet because the flak was throwing the planes around. And of course, when we hit the fog, these pilots, were no different than us. They'd never been in combat either. They immediately thought about to scatter out so they wouldn't hit each other. And that's one of the reasons that we were dropped in so many places where we shouldn't be. And I think it's wrong to have castigated them because uh, they had no other op option. And I'm sure there would have been a lot more casualties with crashing planes had they not done that. But anyway, people have asked me, was I afraid? And I will have to tell you, we were young and dumb, and all of these long strings of tracers were coming up to the plane, hitting the plane, and they were absolutely beautiful, and there was nothing in my feelings except fascination. We had three jump zones, and I, I was on jump zone D, which in the history of books is called the slaughterhouse. And the reason for that was there was two regiments of SS, and two of Panzer Grenadiers, and we jumped right on top of them. Now, also, we were given orders that no weapons were to be loaded until after you got out of your harness. As a result of that, many people were killed before they could get out of their harness. And that was dropped after Normandy because it was a tragedy. My colonel, my company commander, were both killed before they could get out of their harness. We had only one officer come out the first night. Then most of them were either killed or scattered where they were not there. Now, due to the training we had, it was not a great problem. We were trained to travel, to train as a unit, and to work as a unit. Also, we were trained to work individually if the units were dispersed on the field. And that's what we did. And people have said, well, you lost your officers. How did that work? I'll tell you how it worked. Somebody stepped up. Nobody gave any commands, just individuals. It, a lot of times a private would step up and lead a group of 10 or 12 men. That's the way it worked. Germans were not trained that way. When they lost their leader, and I've talked to paratroopers that were against us, when they lost their leader, they, they were in chaos. We were not. We function just as we should normally do. Wars are all terrible. Pee-wee, Pee I don't mean to interrupt you for a second. I know there, there's some people in the crowd who want to ask you some questions, and we're kind of 
tight on time. Okay. So there have been people chomping at the bit, sitting in their seat to ask you guys some questions. So there's a question in the back. Sir, yes. I'll, g I'll give this one to you, yes. Don. Were you ever nervous when you saw one of your commanders get shot? Yes. Scared to death. Speak into that microphone right there. Okay. Uh oh. Yeah. Here, go ahead. You got, got a, I got got a hammer? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to arm wrestle a guy that did that before me. Yeah. Thank you very much, Tim. Uh, so what was the question? The question, <laughs> the question I was. I know what the question was. <laughs> was I ever nervous? Yes, I was nervous. Every time somebody got shot, I was nervous, yeah. But uh, now, am I, is it my turn or what? <laughs> sure, I mean, we're just taking some questions well, from the we, crowd. We have, we have a better talker than I am sitting here. He was doing a very good job. That's what I was thinking. He was, I don't want to take nothing away from him. Ed, how about answering that same question? I mean, you, you from a leadership position, you were a leader. Oh, I um, was? Yes, you were. You were a leader. Yeah, I was yeah. a leader. Yep. Can that's you what, hear me? That's what they tell me. Is this mic on? Yeah, it's on. Will you, will you talk about when you, when you saw someone you knew or someone who was under you, serving under you, get shot? I mean, guys talk about the fact that you just have to move on. You're in the midst of a battle. I mean, what was it? What let, was like? let me get something straight. Incidentally, I'm delighted to be here with you folks. As a matter of fact, at my age, I'm delighted to be anywhere and know where I am. <laughs> uh, you don't know, I'll tell business, you. business, let's get straight. Awesome. We're in Mississippi. Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, I started as a buck private as a recruit with these gentlemen, and I was very lucky. I went up the ladder, and uh, as I say, lucky, I was at the right place at the right time. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I was listening to my friend Pee Wee. Hell, I was wondering what I'm doing here. He's got all the answers and all the questions and so forth, and he's my hero, and so is this gentleman. Now. Uh, as far as being a leader and being frightened, damn right, I was just as frightened as anyone else. And if anyone says that he wasn't frightened during the war, he's crazy as hell. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Don, you want to follow up? Go ahead. Yes, I'll follow up. Thank you. <laughs> From us guys over here. But, uh... Going all the way back, well, not quite to Pee Wee's time. He, he's been here forever, and I think he was one of the founders of the Airborne. But, uh, and so, so was Ed. But I came in late. I was a depression uh, child. I never finished the uh, 10th grade. Uh, I went to work, and uh, a lot of things I didn't do. But my brother finally got his call to go into the military, and he had a deferment because he was working in a vital spot in the, in the industry and the production. And uh, they wanted him to stay in, and he said, no, he says, uh, it's my turn, I'm going. You can do without me. And the, the, the factories did go on. So he was right there, and he put his uh, muscles to work, and he went down the Pacific in the Airborne, in the 11th Airborne, and he had his left leg blown off, and that ended his career. But I uh, followed his way, and I uh, went into the paratroopers in uh, Fort, uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. And the old frying pan, was a frying pan there when you were yeah. there? Yep, yeah, it was there. And it was uh, aptly named because it was, it, when you got out there in the morning, there could be frost. When you opened the door, there's frost on there. Within about 10 minutes, uh, the sand turned to a frying pan. And we worked on that all, all day long. And your uniform every day was uh, shorts and boots. And that's it. 
But uh, I think it was, uh, when I look back at it, it was men like Pee Wee who built the paratroopers and built a lot of other things that took a little bit more thinking than what had been going on for years. <clears throat> we um, got in the paratroopers, and I, I tried to join the paratroopers along with to follow my brother, and what happened was that uh, somehow the military, with all of its efficiency, uh, drafted me when I turned, on my 18th birthday, I went down and volunteered, and they drafted me into the, uh, to go into the paratroopers, let's put it that way. And uh, the military drafted me into the horse cavalry. And uh, the horses don't do too well on the mechanized end of it. So, so I went on to, uh, the only thing is, there's not much to clean up afterward. But uh, I went down to Fort, uh, Fort Riley, Kansas, in a horse cavalry. And I almost refused the direct order to get, get on a mount and ride. I said, I would not do it. I'm not going to ride a mount. If I, if I spend four years in here, when I get out, I'm still not going to ride. And that irritated the colonel, who had big, shiny riding boots and spurs and the whole ball of wax, and he didn't like me. But he softened up after I saw him a few times, and he said, uh, forget. He says, uh, I want you to go ahead and with your wants. You want to be a paratrooper, you're going to be one. He said, I was about three quarters of the way through my training, and he says, uh, go back to your uh, barracks, and he says, pack your bags, he says, and wait there for a Jeep. And I did, and the Jeep picked me up, took me to Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, when I got, got out of the Jeep, they said, welcome to Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, excuse me. Excuse me. Well, welcome to Fort Benning, Georgia, home of the paratroopers. So I came in on the tail end of all these uh, other experiments that these other brave men went out. I mean, who was going to jump with a static line or something like that? All these new innovations, and they, and they took them on. And the men that went before me, they built the paratroopers, but I'm, with, I'm very, very, very proud to be, call myself a paratrooper. I went through everything that they put me through. And I put in my time. I uh, did fracture my right leg. And before I was ready, the doctor didn't get out, did not give me an approval, but I still went up and I jumped. I, I said, my buddies went on. They finished their five jumps. They went on to North Carolina, Fort Riley. No, it wasn't Fort Riley. I was, can't, I was a horse. I'm getting mixed up with the horses again. <laughs> But uh, anyway, I went on to um, meet my buddies, and went and I joined them, and we we went through the uh, paratroopers and became paratroopers. And we did in, uh, invent a lot of things, like firing. I differ a little bit with Pete. I I always go with a loaded gun, but uh, I have one uh, not with me tonight, but. <laughs> What I did have, I, I, well, I am not going to tell that story. <laughs> but I, I was walking around like, to get my license plates, and uh, I had my, you have to have a license, driver's license to get a, a, a pistol permit. So I walked into the, um, to get my driver's license and, and my license for my automobile, and I didn't know it, but I left my pistol permit sticking out of my back pocket. <laughs> I wondered why everybody was looking at me, but I believe in readiness. I don't <laughs> care. You never know what you're going to run into, but you've got to be very careful about the people and the laws that handle that, too. I know what um, my buddy is saying. He said, don't walk around with a loaded pistol. Don't. I know a couple of guys that did that with a with a mortar a mortar shell, and they were banging on a nail with it, and it blew up and killed all killed half the barracks full. You don't do those things. Common sense will prevail. It should. 
Anyway, getting back to the training, uh, I went to my horse training uh, to begin with, and then I went on to my uh, parachute training, and we had the new T5 chute with a static line and all these other implements that some of these men here to my right and left have uh, helped uh, perfect, and through, through their courage and danger that they faced. And uh, now I ca uh, came on, I went uh, into the, did you, did you want to get in? Oh, okay. I could, I could, I could do just a little bit more. Yeah. Um, <laughs> These two have to be separated. But uh, anyway, I did, I did go into the paratroopers and I went overseas as a paratrooper and uh, I made, I made it into uh, England, uh, into Ireland, to England, Scotland, a whole bit. And I joined the 101st, 506 in, in England, all born England. We lived in horse stables, which took me back to my earlier days. But these uh, stables were scrubbed, cleaned, painted, and they were the most beautiful barracks I've ever been in. And it has four men to a stable, two up and two down on the bunks, open the door on the top for a breeze, open the door on the bottom, open both of them, whatever. But we, we had very nice accommodations. And I think the reason they did that is they put the uh, new paratroopers in there and loaded it up because the, the Germans had planes flying over every day, several times a day, and if there was something new, they knew it. Uh, the spotters did, and so what they did is they just let them th get, stay used to their barracks or their uh, stables, and that's what they got used to, and that's what they reported. And there were still stables when we went in there, and we had stable. Uh, there were still stables there when we uh, jumped, parachuted into Normandy, and when we finally parachuted into Normandy. Uh, the weather turned bad. It was bad for three days, blowing tent stakes out of the ground and everything else. But we stay, uh, we went and we actually got on the planes, got our gear on, got our chutes on, got our gear on, and we got on the planes, the old C-47s, the bucket seats, and everybody sitting on an angle on a wet seat. But we uh, fastened ourselves in and got ready to go. And the wind got so high that they sent a jeep around and they said the jump has been postponed. We went back soaking wet. I was so wet, and I wasn't alone, but when we walked, the water ran out of the tops of our boots. And we went back to the tents, and I didn't even feel like uh, getting undressed, so I just wore my boots and my jumpsuit and all the gear I had, and I went to sleep on the cot. But all the time that we were in those tents, they had German soldiers w walking through our tents. But they were they were Americans, but they weren't allowed to talk to us, so they could we could detect their accents and so on. They came in and out of our uh, uh, tents at will, carrying schmeisers, loaded schmeisers, and so on, uh, potato mashers in their belts and whatever they had or in their boots. And uh, they took the part of a uh, German soldier. So we, we would be doing something and look up, maybe playing checkers or something, look up, and there's four or five German soldiers with their weapons. But they were, uh, they were not Germans. They, we learned, you know, at that, about that time, we would guess that they were uh, make-believe. So we, we came back the next day. They said this, uh, the sun was going to come out. It's going to be a sunshiny day. June the 6th is going to be a beautiful day, just right for a jump. And we went down, put the gear back on the planes of wing, wing loads and so on. And we did, uh, we made our parachute jump into Normandy. And a lot of people think that we went straight from England into Normandy, and that is uh, not true the way the plan worked took off from England, flew out over the Atlantic at 500 feet to get under, uh, that was 500 feet was below the German radar. So we stayed under the German radar all the way out on the Atlantic, back around, 
We came back between the islands of Jersey and Guernsey. We went around the uh, Continent Peninsula. And we were coming in from the backside of France, heading towards the English Channel, flying over to towards England, our home base of the, of the landing field. So if the Germans did pick us up at that time by a scout plane, they would think we were, we were out on a patrol and we were coming back home. But that was uh, the, the idea, but we took, we took off from England out over the ocean at 500 feet, not above 500 feet, made our circle, came in around the continent peninsula between the islands of Jersey and Guernsey, and we made ready for our jump. And we came in o over the peninsula. We went down low to get below the uh, small arms fire because it was a mass of that. And they could knock a plane down if it hit it right. And then we climbed up to our jump altitude, which was 600, 900 feet. And we were heading towards England. So if that's where you heard the stories a lot of time that a, a American paratrooper went down with the plane or had to bail out and he hit the water and with all of his equipment he went to the bottom immediately and he drowned. He's still there. All these years he's still there. So we, we did make the jump in that manner. We made the pattern in that manner and then everything worked out right. But uh, we went around and we went so when we uh, came in from uh, our, our jump, towards our jump, we, we I think I, think I lost good. something. But uh, we, we came in from the, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, we came, came in uh, from the backside of France, heading, heading toward England, and we parachuted into Normandy. Uh, but we were so scattered out from the storms and the residue that we were lost. We didn't know where we were at. The pilots didn't know where we were at. Uh, they guesstimated, and they did the best they could, and they dropped, but they dropped us in Normandy. And we're lucky to hit France. And we went on from there as individuals and getting in uh, masses, and uh, we, we went forward with, with the attack. And I recall when I landed, I was, uh, I was my 18th birthday. OK, I was 18. I went into the paratroopers on that day. I was sworn in. And on the uh, June the 6th, it was uh, June, June the 6th, we parachuted into Normandy. And I'm trying. Don, I know there are some people who wanted to ask you some questions. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, we only have a little bit of time left. Let's, uh, let's do some rapid fire questions. Yes, Jeff. Uh, forgive me, but uh, my question is actually for James Matteo, if that's Sure, okay. we can let Jimmy talk. Um, first off, I just want to say uh, thanks for your great performance in uh, Band of Brothers. I think in the uh, Best Stone episode, you got shot in the ass. Uh, <laughs> That's why he's sitting sideways still. Yeah. Uh, Foy, yeah. Oh, Foy, to be yeah. truthful, I, I was in a recent accident, and I came out with a post. What, what do I have? Yeah, I have some kind of a thing that whacked my, my, some of my uh, attention. I even talking a little bit. But I, uh, I'm trying, um, and, I, and I know I'm accurate on my words about the about the drop zone and so on, but I can't hear too well. That's okay. Um, You're doing fine, Don. The question was for Jimmy, uh, Matteo. Oh, yeah, no, no okay. wonder I couldn't understand him. <laughs> Sorry about that. The question uh, was, what do you think about Jimmy Matteo? I'm just kidding. It wasn't um, I think he's a wonderful addition to our panel up here. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, James, uh, I think a lot of us in here are trained to be future officers, and we'll have a lot, you know, of young enlisted men that, as uh, Jim Martin explained, you know, will be very, you know, kind of very hyped up for war, very, you know, kind of gung ho. And it made me think of this scene that you had with um, it was in one of the later episodes with Private O'Keefe when you were manning a machine gun position, and he was, you know, kind of singing like war songs, and you had, you know, kind of shut him up a bit. And my question was, you know. How did you prepare for that scene, if you, like, you know, remember any of it accurately? And, you know, what was kind of your reaction, you know, having to 
kind of lash out at you know a younger kind of you know gung ho soldier in, in that context. Right. Well, it, if I remember, it was episode nine, and uh, I just remember getting the script, and I was really excited because. Uh, there was a nice meaty thing for me to do, and I just wanted to make sure that I represent Frank Perconti and, uh, uh, you know, just get some FaceTime for him and and who he really was, and so his family could see him on the on the big screen. So when I first got it, I was excited, and uh, O'Keefe was a replacement. And when replacements came in, it was kind of odd. And I was telling some of the guys the stories last night. I had a few drinks. That we had already been there uh, eight nine months and. We were a, a unit, like the original guys that were there. So when replacements came in, you knew that they were maybe going to be in for just one episode as a guest star. So they, they, we treated them like replacements. We didn't know if they were going to be here or whatever, and it, just how it was. So I didn't really take to, to liking him because I wasn't supposed to, because we were trying to be as real and accurate as possible. So, uh, you know, I gave him a really, really tough time. So when I got to him and I got to the scene, I didn't bother with him, but I wanted to grab him, because I was like, yeah, this is the time I get to grab him, throw him on the floor, maybe punch him in the face and tell him, you don't know what war is. It's the first time I get to wipe my, you guys know how it goes. There's a bunch of cuss words nose, I want to say yeah, here. Wipe your nose. Wipe, wipe, wipe your nose. And But when I got there, the director was like, you know, you, you've seen some combat and uh, for quite a while, the, the character, please. And... Uh, <laughs> So, uh, uh, you know, I don't know if you'd go after him as much. I was like, no, 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 I'd go after him, I want to go after him. He goes, no, I think you should kind of pull back and just tell him from a distance. And it worked, it worked. But I just remembered that, uh, you know, that scene for me was, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a memorable one, and I'll never forget it. Uh, and, you know, I think I still call him, instead of Old Keef, I call him Old Beef, because that's what I call him. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah, that was, uh, episode nine was a really tough episode because we had a lot of fun, the guys, and when we got to the tail end, episode nine was about the concentration camp, so a, a lot of the joking ended. Uh, again, the producers were very, very clever about holding back that, uh, specific, uh, uh, setup, the lot, we weren't allowed to go to it. The concentration camp. camp. We weren't allowed to go to it, it was in the middle of a field, and, uh, so when they brought us to set, it was pretty much our eyes were first time seeing it and seeing the people, you know, the guys, the actors behind the fence, and, and I don't know how they got those guys. So a lot of our reactions were, were very real, uh, some of the guys, but it, it, that that was a tough episode. That was, uh, th that was a really tough episode, but uh, yeah, but a great scene. And, and, and actually, he wound up being a really nice guy, the actor, Old Beef. <laughs> Old Beef. Okay. Couple of quick questions, and we're going to give the uh, the final word to the highest ranking member of the panel, which will be Colonel Shame. So, a couple um, of quick questions. Yes, sir. Another question for James about the uh, Band of Brothers. Uh, I know um, before filming and everything, you had a lot of interactions with the veterans. Uh, I'd like to know like how that affected your life since then. Oh, I, I mean, tremendously. Tim will tell you it, it's. Uh, I always say it's a job that keeps on giving because I, I get to spend days and hear stories uh, with these men and uh, you know meet all you influential people and the young folks. Uh, but, you know, you went in and as an actor, because it's a great job to be working with Stephen and Tom, so you're really excited about that. Uh, but what I got out of it, most of all, was my friendship with Frank and and uh, and all the veterans, and a history lesson, which I didn't know much about. I grew up on the streets of the Bronx. I wasn't educated, really, in, in World War II. Uh, and my brothers, my band of brothers, my actor buddies, uh, have now become brothers. I mean, we see each other a lot. Uh, but it opened a lot of doors as, as an actor, which is great because of you know how how good the show was. But I I got more out of it on this end, traveling, meeting influential people, and and it it just you know made more of a man of me. I just grew up really fast, and I get to do special things like this, and I continue to do it. So. Uh, Uh, my question is for the uh, whole panel. Um, in what drop zone was St. Mary Glees? Did any of you enter the town of St. Mary Glees? Um, and if you did, uh, what were your feelings when you entered the town? Did any of you, I know, Pee Wee, you didn't, but did any of you have a drop zone near St. Mary Glees? And were you in St. Mary Glees immediately uh, on June 6th or D-Day plus one or two? I was in there probably on uh, D plus two. What did the what did the village look like at that point? It was shot up. 
we went, nothing r real heavy stuff, no, we went like bombs or anything. Some of the bombs were. Uh, I think the one that escaped the most was the church. The church didn't, had very little damage, but the main street of town uh, had a lot of damage, artillery. There was one, yes ma'am, it'll be the final question from the audience, we're running a little bit late. This is not so much a question, but just a doable thing. If I'm not mistaken, they disassembled the stables in England and moved them to the museum in Tacoa, Georgia. And they found letters behind those boards, you know, to men's families who thought they might not return. But that's, a, that's some place that people here can visit, and it's really worth seeing. I was there when they were dismantling the stables. Can you hear me? And uh, of course, the stables were honest part of the World War II. And what I wanted to say, may I talk now? <laughs> is, it, is, it, is it okay? Right. You're the colonel. I'm, I'm delighted to be on these panels. I hate them because I I scared the hell out of me when they tell me about what happened during the war. <laughs> uh, most of you people have read the Band of Brothers and seen the series. Personally, I think it's the great thing that happened to it, but I personally think it's the biggest bunch of bull that's ever <laughs> been put on the screen or in between two covers because I was there from day one to day after. And 90% of it is garbage, but good story, made a lot of money. And Frank Piccani was one hell of a soldier. Thank you. And these two here are tops. And incidentally, this is one of the finest authors we've had about World War II. But he came from a c bunch of cattle raisers. He ships a lot of bull. <laughs> no, 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 no. I love him, all of them. Uh, this is not the Ricky Lake show. I just want you to know that, right? We're, we're, <laughs> no, cool. No, we're no. cool with that. I, too, were, I was in all of these things. And I have just two things that I'm proud of for he, World War II. He's the one that taught us. Sir? <laughs> I'm going to hold that right there. I got it. OK. The first, seriously, I was only proud of two things, very proud. Number one, they say I was the first battlefield commission in the regiment. I was the first battlefield commission in Normandy. I was commissioned or told I was going to be commissioned 4 a.m. in the morning on the 6th of June. So that's pretty good, I thought. And you know how they make battlefield commissions? They put all the names in a helmet, and they pull one out, and that was me. <laughs> the other thing that I'm very proud of, I was commander of the patrol platoon of the regiment. And we got all the dirty jobs that came along. Most of them were picking up German prisoners in American uniforms in Bastogne. I brought more men home from our platoon than any of the 500 platoons in the 101st Airborne Division. And I was known as the SOB, son of the battalion. <laughs> that was my nickname, SOB. Thank you very much, and I appreciate listening. <laughs>